Welcome to the Belfry Hockey Podcast. My name is Daryl Belfry. We are in Season 3, and this is Episode 14, which is going to be centered around communication challenges. Uh, I find that in communicating with players, especially in articulating plays or talking about different hockey situations, uh, when communicating with players, there's a lot of challenges that go with that. And one of the first things I wanted to talk about was the challenges surrounding tense. So what I mean by tense is the tenses of like past tense, what just happened, present tense, what's happening exactly right now, and then what's going to happen in the future. And um, I find that so much of coaching as it relates to the feedback that we're providing with players, if you really took stock and, and really uh, monitored what your communication is with players, I would say that it's grossly skewed in the direction of past tense. You're talking about things that happened and uh, there might be some corrections about what might happen next, but the player's experience is in two tenses. So they're, they're looking at exactly what's happening right now. They're playing in the present tense. And then with any luck, they also have forethought. So they're kind of thinking or forecasting ahead as to what might happen. And so in your communication with your players, you're talking about what happened and what you'd like to see happen, which is the past tense and future tense. But you have no ability to put yourself really in their shoes in the moment. So you're never going to really understand the nuances that surround the present tense of what's actually happening. And I think that that's a really relevant thing to understand and to think about because the player is trying to process what's going on in the present tense. And then afterwards, you're asking for a reflection like, you know, they come back to the bench after something happened. Like, hey, what happened? What did you see? And so then they're trying to like think about what's happening. I know myself, I've spoken to a lot of players about what's happened, especially like what just happened, how they felt, what they thought. And I'm thinking that they're going to be able to describe this and I want to hear great detail. And oftentimes they're, they're not able to do that. They're just experiencing what's happening and they're really not all that equipped to be able to describe what they what they were what they were experiencing at that time so now they're trying to recall different aspects that occurred and so that's where i think that we have a little bit of a challenge as it relates to providing feedback and communicating with players and so what i've tried to do more of is initially in the in my own personal development i really tried to get much better at feedback which feedback is something happened it's in the past tense so anything as soon as you're talking about feedback that means something happened and now you're offering uh, some some discussion points on what happened and I and I focused a lot on that like how I was communicating with the player the questions that I was asking how I was trying to elicit a response to get a better understanding of what they were experiencing during the actual event and then trying to give them some communication tools to describe more effectively what had happened so I could drill down to see if there was any way that I could help them make better decisions or better plays more frequently or make that play more that worked it went well what did you see what happened during that play take me into that moment so that we can recreate it and, and and do it more in the future. And that was about the extent of what I was talking about as it relates to forecasting. And I think we should spend a lot more time in, on forecasting and teaching players about thinking ahead. The game of hockey, when you get to a certain level, is impossible to play as it's happening. If you're just thinking and reading and reacting to what's going on, right directly in front of you, you will be a step behind. And that happens sooner than we like to admit. I think that that type of play 
tends to happen and that thought process tends to happen to a lot of kids earlier. So like there's kids that are playing good hockey at 12 years old that are living essentially in the past. They're, they're trying to read something and then react to it. And so they're trying to gather some type of information during the actual play as it's happening. And then of course, because they're reacting to what's just happened or what's happening, they're invariably gonna be a bit of a step behind. So the goal is to try to get them into forecasting or forethought. Can you, can you see what's happening now and anticipate what's going to happen next. What about the conditions that you see? What what uh, indicators are you getting that tell you ah the play might go that way? It's probable that this is where it's going to happen. Where, where the play is going to go next? Now you start to make movement towards what you think is going to happen next. That becomes the forethought uh, aspect of it and the ability to forecast. I didn't really spend a ton of time in that space until recently. And now over the last several years, I've tried to be much more effective in my ability to convey forethought and forecasting. And that's to players of all levels, um, to be able to get a better sense of, let's just take what information you have now and let's try to process that information better so when we talk about process and this is kind of where I want to go with this discussion is oftentimes the context surrounding processing is the speed at which someone is processing so like they just can react quicker or they process and that's kind of the impression you get is they just see it clearer and they see it faster and that allows them to make decisions quicker and execute faster and yes there's some some of that that's going on but more of it that's happening is these players are seeing something in advance they have a have insight into what's going to happen and then the reason that their mind is able to slow down in a way in which allows them to process more of their environment the easier it is for them to to then make these easier decisions they can make clearer decisions better decisions more impactful decisions uh, to influence the way the game is played where there's another kid who's not processing it as fast he's in the past tense so he sees it then he's trying to react players who are trying to do that they're they're a step behind and it, the whole speed of the game ends up being coming up an issue within their decision making and just how comfortable that they feel so the answer to making them feel a little more comfortable and improve decision making is to try to get them to be able to forecast things better. So how do you forecast things better? Well, that's being able to process your environment. Like what's happening? What indic what what are you looking for? What things are indicators that tell you what's potentially going to happen? So for example, uh, you're on the you're on the four check, but you're F two, F one is going in, and they're four checking uh, the their defenseman. The defenseman goes back and gets it, and the defense and the four checker is doing a great job of getting the inside, and so they forced the four checker to go to their uh, go to the towards the corner. So they're shortening the ice. They don't let the defenseman get the back of the net, and that defenseman is on their backhand. So now they force the defenseman away from their forehand onto their backhand and into the short amount of ice. So now I'm F2 and I'm taking a look and I see that they have a winger here who's gonna post up on the wall. I see they have a center in a pretty good spot. And so now I'm F2 and I gotta anticipate here what's gonna happen so I can contribute to the play. If my F1 gets a contact, and is able to force the puck or because they force them backhand they're not as comfortable kind of mishandle it now it's loose in the corner well of course now I'm gonna go in there and see if I can come up with this loose puck but I also want to try to anticipate like where could this puck go if the players on their backhand I'm also gonna notice on their way back how many times they shoulder check like do they even know that I'm here do they know that uh, that they have winger support 
Is the winger telling them that they have winger support? Is there any communication that's going on here? Do they have like an option on the backside? Like could he fake like he's going to go towards his backhand to pull F1 in there and then uh, and then bump it on his heels to make a play to the back so it's almost like a reverse to his partner? Like I'm looking at these conditions. What am I evaluating? What am I? What part of this am I taking in that allows me to decide? Okay, well, where am I going to go? Plus, I have our team system, which also tells me where I should be and when. There's some guidelines, but you know, there's a lot of gray here. Like, there's some decisions I'm going to have to make, regardless of how tight your system is. No matter how well coached you are, there's still decisions that have to be made. There's there's reads that you have to pick up. You got to get some idea of what's about to happen, and then there's uh, uh, there's some gray area that gives you a little bit of latitude to be able to come up with this puck. So again, like a lot of times a team system, part of the best part about a team system and teams that are well coached tend to play faster because they're in the right position sooner, which is an indicator of forecasting and forethought. They're already in the right spot, so now it's easier for them to then go from the right spot, that right spot, to the next right spot. When you're in the wrong spot, to try to go to the next right spot is difficult. You're catching up or you're, it's, it's hard to do that. So being on a well-coached team that has a good, a good structure where it allows you to then have a good understanding of where you should be, that gives you a better opportunity to be in the gray a little bit more appropriately. Where a team that's not, uh, that doesn't have a good team structure they play a little bit more like if they're out on the pond, they're basically going exclusively on reads. They're often going to be like a little bit on the wrong, like they're going to have piece, pieces of, of, their, of their group that are going to be disconnected from what should be going on. They're going to have people that are a little bit late, a little bit early. They're reading things differently because they're just not on the same page. So the gray takes up a wider, a wider percentage of the amount of time in which uh, which is in the player's space as to what they're going to do that contributes to their decision making which is why you see some kids who when there's not a lot of structure they play really well because then they're totally in the gray and they're just on instinct the whole time they're just trying to figure out okay there's the puck where's it going next boom i'm gone without any real regard to where where they are in the what their role is in the play what what their movement what impact that has on their teammates etc 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 so they just go play and sometimes they get the puck and sometimes they don't but they get it enough that it kind of makes uh makes them a reasonable player then they move up to a level where it's just hard to do that like you're you you really need to be in the right spot because in order for us to play fast Everybody needs to know where everybody is so that you can be predictable in your position because oftentimes like I'm just trusting that you're going to be there and I put the puck there. Like it's a quick look and I've processed a lot of the information but it's not always possible to process all of the information but I can trust that you're going to be in these particular spots because that's the way in which we play. So these are the considerations that go into the communication challenge like how well coached is is appropriate for this team and how well coached are they in the in the, in the indicators are how connected the team is when they move you see people moving together so when the d are in the d zone they move together when they're at the blue line they move together you see like a seamless reaction between a deactivating and f3 sliding in their spot like those things don't happen like deactivates there's a space of time where nothing happens then f3 is like oh i gotta go there and then they jump into that spot you don't see those like breaks along the way of movement the movement is just very seamless it looks like it's a coordinated effort that's a team that's well coached they understand the movement cues of when they should go or where the patterns are about to go which allows them to anticipate these things are about to happen and then off they go so those those aspects are critical pieces to your communication with your player because 
how much of the gray are we in? How much latitude do we really have to be able to make just decisions based on the conditions of the puck and the conditions of the play? So when kids are younger, it's better if they don't play with a lot of structure because then they start building these muscles of forecasting. They can start to anticipate where the puck is. So you have little Johnny who scores 50 goals on loose pucks because he doesn't ever really get involved. He just waits, waits, waits. As soon as the loose puck goes, he lets doesn't get in any board battles, doesn't get in any battles himself, keeps himself loose. So then he's just watching the pile and jumps and, and jumps on a loose puck. Or plays with a right winger, doesn't handle the puck particularly well, but wants to handle the puck. So pass it to that guy, he gets it. And then of course uh my guy in knowing that he doesn't handle the puck particularly well tends to lose it you slide in behind him to be able to pick up that puck. Or you got another guy who likes to shoot it. You pass it to him, you're not going to get a pass back, you're just going to shoot it. So he's going to put his head down, skate down the ice, he's going to fire it. So you see this guy, he's like, well, I already know what he's going to do. There's no sense me moving to get a puck. I'm not going to get that puck. I'm going to go to where I anticipate that the puck is going to get shot, and that's where I'm going to go because that's probably where it's going to be next. So you get all these like indicators that players are processing at a very simple level. Um, and then if they're, you know, if they are in a good situation where they're getting some level of coaching, where they're learning like little bit of a, like a two man game of, hey, give and go, move, try to get the puck back, move into good areas, try to anticipate. There's a little bit of timing. The passing has a little bit of timing in. You got, might have to slow down, you might have to speed up. These are all decisions that players are making based on the initial conditions of the puck. So that's why the younger they are, the more you just want them to free play so they can build up these, like what we call the early stages of hockey sense. These guys understand how to get the puck based on what happens. There's no passing. There's all this is one loose puck after the next. And that's the early stages of this development. Then as it moves forward, the more every year that goes by, there's more and more structure that comes into play or should be. And, you know, some really good players never really get into a situation where they have really any accountability. They just play and they just score at a rate that's enough to keep them above the coaching. So they're never really going to get told or held accountable to be in any one place or time or whatever. Just go and you score enough. So don't worry about it. But eventually that catches up. Like at some point you get to a spot where they're like, yeah, no, you, we need you to be in certain spots at certain times and this is it. And then what happens is that's when the gray goes from 100% down to a much lower percentage. And depending on how good you are and depending on what the circumstances are and who you're being coached by, that gray can get really compressed or there could be a little bit more gray. But there's always some is my point. doesn't matter how strict a situation that you're in, there's always some gray area that allows you to operate. And that's where we are. That's where there's a blend of hockey sense that comes into, hey, how good of a player, uh, how, how much structure are, do we have? And then how much um, gray area is there for me to be able to make decisions and then I'm going to learn the hockey sense part of it is understanding how to blend both of those things. So I'm in the right spot most often, which allows me to play fast with my teammates, probably allows me to get more pucks, passes, all that sort of stuff. But then uh, once I get it or in the process of getting it, I manage the speed, the spacing, the, where, the routes that I take. These are all uh, decisions that I can make based on the conditions of the puck as I'm about to get it. So before I get it, I'm scanning. What am I scanning for? Well, I'm scanning to see, like, do they have a guy who's going to be playing over top of me? If they do, then I have to slow down to manage my space. If they don't have someone playing over top of me, and now there's more of a runway, well, now maybe I can build that speed to go into the puck. So I'm scanning to see where the pressure is. I'm also scanning to see... The pressure that's surrounding my 
puck carrier who's going to ultimately give me the puck. That dictates the route that I'm going to take to make sure that I'm available multiple times. So I, when I pick this puck up, I want to pick it up with my feet on fire because the conditions of the pressure suggest that that's what I should do. So there's always gray. And the players who can best manage the ability to be have good, great structure, they're in the right spot all the time, and they also have an ability to really maximize the gray, those are superstar NHL players. That's what they do. They have excellent structure habits. They're in the right spot most often. They're very predictable to their teammates, so like that allows them to get the puck a lot. But then they have all these other abilities inside the gray, and the gray is enough that allows them to do special things. The lower you are in the lineup, the less gray that's afforded to you, more structure that's provided, and then now you're just trying to do your do your job and stay inside your structure as best as possible. And then there's a little bit of gray, but you're conservative inside of that. So how are you co-communicating to these guys? That's the thing. Understanding how much gray area that they have and what those decisions are that comes down to two things in my mind. Number one, it comes down to forecasting. And forecasting has to do with their ability to take in information, process that information in advance of the play, and then decide what they're going to do next. That's one aspect of it, right? The forecasting piece. The second aspect is the feel. During it, they can feel, like really good players, they can feel things. They feel pressure. They feel spacing. Uh, they feel the conditions changing. The, that's all part of that. So feel, there's like they can feel like how far they are from the boards, for example. They can feel how, much, how close they are to people. They can feel a stick. They can feel contact that's coming. They have that ability, right? And so that's different than scanning because that's it's it's related in the sense that they're it's part of the collecting, but it's another sense. It's a sense that they have, and we want to develop that. And so we should be asking questions about feel and you know, not necessarily did you see the guy coming, but could you feel where did you feel where you were in space? Because there's a lot of times when kids are younger, where you know, they're in awkward spots. This is why bringing the body contact age down can be problematic because they're just not mature enough to feel that spacing yet. Where when they get older, they have enough reps, they can feel that spacing. And if we can make that connection, then we really have something. So in order to bring body contact to a place where they're going to use it um, younger, which there is even when there's no body contact, there's still a lot of body contact, especially around the boards. This is where having that feel for where you're vulnerable, feel for where you are on the boards, feel of pressure. That's a that's a sense that we need to be communicating with the player and trying to understand more about because we can see them in vulnerable areas, but how do we communicate that and then how do we help improve that? Well, first we have to understand these aspects. And then did they scan? Like, did they actually look? So we have two pieces. The scanning, which is processing the environment, seeing what's going on in advance of what's going to happen. Or, and, and also not only in advance of what's about to happen, but also what's going to happen. You're taking in all the pieces of information in the environment to be able to process the the situation and then the feel aspect and I don't think we talk enough about feel and in the feel space and so when I go off on my tangent about um, about having small area games gradually move from you know cross ice and move from you know nets in funny spots and you know managing small spaces like in a, in a cor two nets in a corner back to back and all that stuff to also putting yourself in situations where you have games or you have uh, conditions or drills or things that you're trying to work on where ice geography is a factor. The reason why ice geography is important is we're trying to take whatever feel we can get 
from these other aspects of of play where it's where it's unusual and convert that into actual areas of the ice so players can get familiar with certain spots of the ice routes they can just feel their way into these spots so, and then you start to see those players they adjust their footwork automatically you can see they don't get to a spot and adjust their footwork on their way there they're already adjusting their route they're getting their timing down because they're familiar with the ice geography so that's a way of also helping convert feel so these are all things we should be in my mind we should be talking so one of the communication challenges that we have is feel we know is a really important aspect the way they feel the game and way they feel pressure and where they feel space all that stuff that's a really important uh, part and it's a big aspect of the stimuli that they're getting in part a lot of the information that they're getting in and when you couple that with how well they're able like how comfortable they are with the speed of the game that impacts feel so you have a player who's very uncomfortable with how fast the game is going that doesn't open their vision if anything it closes their vision because now they're just hyper focused on this one area so now they're taking in way less information that's also going to impact their ability to feel so now they're losing twice so we want them to win both times. So we want the game to kind of slow down to a comfortable level where they can see the what's going to happen. They can forecast what might happen next, and then they can feel themselves in space. So if we're not communicating with players on feel and talking about feel, then we're missing a big area of their development. But it's difficult because it's not something that you can... Like it's not something that you it's easy to see. You have to ask those questions. You gotta find that dialogue. You gotta get in and see if you can get the player to open up. Now, some of the things you can see where there's vulnerability for too long a time, which tells you that obviously they're not feeling that. Okay, well, what are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna help improve that ability? And that's also the the whole idea of scanning. One of my arguments with scanning is I don't like that we only talk about get your head up or look over your shoulders or make sure you you know you scan you take which infers to to look like look both ways okay for what what are we looking for what types of information are we trying to collect so from a young age through the process of their development we should be adding to the environment that we're talking about so during COVID, so one of the, I was in this, pretty deep in this a whole uh, aspect of feel and also collecting information, just how much information can you collect. So here's what I did. Um, Ella, my daughter, she was off the ice, of course, because the rinks were closed. And so we had her rollerblades and we had the green biscuit. And we were doing stuff we were shooting outside as everybody was on the net on the in the in the garage and then um, we were doing some rollerblading and different things and so I had we had the Mars blades and we had the green biscuit and we were going so I, I was going through this development in my own mind of how to kind of take my understanding to another level so I said to her I said listen I want you to take one we we live uh, in a in a uh, in a play in a neighborhood that has multiple streets and some um, and some a lot of um, a, a lot of cul-de-sacs so what I was telling her was I want you to go down you know do this street or do this square get into this cul-de-sac and then come back so you know it's a reasonable distance and she has to care, handle the puck the whole time while she's going through the neighborhood and I said to her, okay, while you're going, I want you to tell me how many uh, people had, how many garage doors were open, how many cars were parked on the street, and how many uh, people that you were able to see. So off she goes. And she's going through, and she comes back, and she gives me the information. Yeah, there was, whatever, seven uh, car uh, garage doors open. There were five cars on the street. And then... There were like six people. I said, okay. 
So now I want you to do it again, but now I want you to tell me what color each car was. And then I also want you to tell me uh, the, the split between men, women, children of the people that you were seeing. And then I also want you to tell me anything else that, that you can. Just collect as much information as you go. So off she goes through the neighborhood and she's just collecting this information. And I was astounded by every time she went around. Uh, and then we did it where we went different routes. So we went around this way, this time. Okay, next time go this way. Go down these streets that are completely different. And again, just keep collecting. And it was fascinating to see as she did it and became aware of trying to collect as much information as she could, the level of detail that she was doing it. So it told me that there was a muscle here that could be developed further and that I should be looking to try to find different ways to develop this. And so it, it just sent me on a whole rabbit hole of ideas um, and research to figure out more ideas about collecting information. So here you are handling the puck, you're skating, and you're collecting, you're collecting information. It's a really cool way. So then when we went, we're able to go on the ice and we start practicing, then it became like uh, how many four checkers are coming? Where, what hand are people that you're going against? Like, you know, how, what's, uh, what, what, how did the conditions change? So one of the things I wanted to do was you do a shoulder check on a retrieval so you do a shoulder check early then you go back and I want you to do another one when you do the the next one so whether it's just before you pick up the puck or just slightly after you pick up the puck now you look how did the conditions change what were the conditions how did they change and just go through some of these ideas and it, it really is fascinating when you start to uh, when you start to make that a thing and what I mean by that is to, you're trying to take the environment and try to see how much detail they can pull out of the environment. That's really, really critical. And, you know, I think that those become really cool dialogues of how to be able to process, have things process clearer. And it becomes a little bit more interesting uh, for the player also because now they're not just like shoulder check and turn back like almost like checking a box like a lot of players like all the way up until to pro I, I felt like when they shoulder check the level of information like the quality of the information that they're correcting the the the, uh, the level of detail that they're collecting just really isn't all that much um, not to the degree of what is coming and which explains why it become, can become very difficult. So we have these two challenges that we're trying to do. We're trying to get players to process, have their processing speed, which processing speed really is amount of information you're collecting before the event is going to occur, and then whether your forecasting was right, and then now you're able to you leverage that forecasting into the present of what you're actually doing and then of course you're forecasting what is going to happen next so that's trying to get them out of read and react which infers i'm going to see something and then do something which now puts you a, a step behind i now want you to be evaluating your environment and forecast what's going to happen next and then make the appropriate movements. So, all that to say, this is a major communication challenge. We, and this is where I really want to spend more time, and I've done a lot of work on it, but want to do more work on it. And in, and even when like I report back to our players, so in my, in my business, we do a, an analysis of the players' games, and then we report to them. I find myself, I found myself before only talking about what had happened. And, and then I would relate it to, like I said, like our success equation and kind of where we were going as it related to their development. But when I was describing the play and nuances in the play and things I liked about it, things I didn't like about it, and some of the res restrictions and all of those things, it was always what had happened. 
and not as much about what's going to happen and what happens next and the forecasting co component of it. And I find myself now not doing it as well as I want to and not nowhere near where I want to be, but I'm making so much better strides. Like this year was probably my best year in my communication of forecasting with my players. And I think the, the results this year also with our players was was much better because and I think in part because I was not talking in the past and I was talking more about this is what you're doing this is what you did but this is how it impacts where you're going and this is why this worked out because you also you know you moved this way you correctly saw this play as it played out and this is where it ended up like there's so there's so many examples of that players also leveraging their habits this is a habit you use all the time. You see this indicator, you pull pull the check into you know a compromising position, and then you're out you then you make your play, but you already know where you're going, and then as soon as they kind of get just past that player, you see them create their advantage. Where before it might take a little longer. We're just not not as fluent in being able to describe forecasting. And I was in, and I feel like I'm better now than I ever have, and I'm anxious to get even better at it with with the players that we're working with. But I I pose it all as a challenge because every all of us want to talk about you know young kids having their head up, you know young kids processing the game, and I don't know that we actually um, are collecting enough information. And as a coach, there's ways that you can you can communicate with players to build that relationship to where they're going to be more inclined to offer up where what they're thinking during a given time gives you an indicator of whether there is this a read and react situation or are they forecasting well i saw this so that's why i did that that's better than you know what what happened during the play like i saw this happen and then i did it i want to say i saw the play developing this way and that's why I went this way, and you can see them moving in advance of the play. That's really positive, and that's where we want it. That's where we want to get to. So that's why, like the old school, like if you're coaching young kids, like just even doing give and go, and having that become a real art form on your team or the group that you're working with, can be so powerful because it is an indicator of forethought. Like, because I got to know where I want to go next. I got to have a reason for why I'm going to go there. And then I gotta manage by the feel I have of when I'm gonna leave. So I give it if I if I give it and go, and the player that I'm passing to doesn't have the pass. Like it's hard for them to actually catch the pass, or I didn't pass it properly, so they gotta handle it. And then now their head's down. By the time they get their head up, it's like I'm already gone. Well, I'm not gonna get that puck back. So I gotta realize, you know, make a better pass, make sure it's on their forehand, make it easier for them to catch the puck. So now when they get it, they're going to get their head up sooner. So now I can time it. So when I leave, I'm going to be able to get that puck. That is a massive skill. And you and it, and there's so many, because we play on teams where there's such a variance of skill ability, you have to adjust to each player you go with. You can't just have a way you do it. You got to adjust based on the conditions. That's all part of it. And there's a unbelievable like little side discussions you can have with players where you can have whether it be you know good listening to where you're listening you kind of ask a question and listen to where they're going to get these like indicators of where their mind is at and then also the peer teaching aspect of it is a major part where they start talking to each other and encouraging them to talk to each other that piece can really take what you're doing from a communication perspective and really blow it up because now when you listen to how they're talking to each other you can get even more insight into how they're processing the game in a way that allows them to play with more forecasting, which is ultimately what we're trying to do is get them to play before it's happening and think about what's happening beforehand and process the environment with such detail, rich detail that allows them to make outstanding decisions more frequently and become a greater impact on the game.